All right, if y'all would turn with me today to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 37. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11 today. Genesis 37, 1 through 11. So today's sermon is titled Family Problems. And it could probably be said that nothing hurts more than being hurt by family. Being hurt by family. And I can say almost everybody in here, if not everybody in here, has probably been hurt by family in some way. Or they may have even hurt their family in some way. The reality is in this world that conflict is inevitable. We should expect conflict and we should prepare for conflict. Why is it inevitable? Because we are fallen people living with fallen people in a fallen world. We're going to have family problems in some way. But here's the thing, Christians, that problem should not be you. No matter what your family does, it is never right for us to sin, to respond in a sinful manner. So we should not be the problem. Scripture tells us as much as lies in us to be at peace with all people. That's not saying that until you basically lose your temper to be at peace. What it means is in your circle of influence that you can control, you need to bring peace to the situation. We're going to have conflict. Prepare for it. The story that we'll look at today is the story of Joseph. And if you know the story of Joseph well, there's a lot of family problems with Joseph. A lot of family problems. And if you look at the story of Joseph, it's not really about man's goodness, man's faithfulness. It's about God's goodness and God's faithfulness. How he works all things together for good to those who love him. How he is continually Sending us in a particular direction. And we know as Christians that good, that purpose, is to make us into the image of Christ. It sometimes takes pressure, doesn't it? To shape our hearts. Our hearts of flesh that God is molding us through these conflicts. Through these family problems. Through these struggles. God is sovereign. We see it all over the story of Joseph. And how Joseph eventually saves his family from starvation. After his brothers had sold him into slavery. He goes through lots of different adventures with that. But God is sovereign. Even through these family problems. God brought the 12 tribes of Israel out of this family. He was sovereign over it. And God came in the flesh through this same family. Jesus Christ, our Savior. God is sovereign over the situation you're dealing with today. That family problem. There's a purpose in it. We may not always know those purposes, but God is always, always working. And he's always using these situations again to make us more like Christ. In Genesis 37, 1 through 11, it says, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bela. And the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Lord, thank you for your word today. And I pray as we look at these family problems of Joseph... That we see the reactions and the behaviors of the individuals in this account. And that we understand that they could have responded in a different way. And that whatever our situation is that we are facing in family problems and conflict, that we can always respond in a way that pleases you. 
Help us not to forget that. Help us to realize that the challenges before us are shaping us into the image of your Son. Guide us as we look at your word today, Lord, and help us to know how we should respond. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, the story of Joseph. Jacob also called Israel. So we're going to look, kind of unpack each one of these individuals here and the groups, the brothers together as well, and talk about some of the things they did wrong and some of the responses they could have had differently. Because remember, these conflicts, these family problems, God allows them to shape us. So first we'll start with Jacob. So Jacob had a favorite son, and he was showing favoritism in a way that really made the, the brothers of Joseph angry. And we see in verse 1 that Joseph had brought a bad report. It's kind of interesting. This was just stuck in here at the beginning of this narrative. But he had brought a bad report of his brothers to his father. Now, how do you think his brothers responded to that? Yeah, they're probably mad about it. So he kind of gives that little conditioning there. But the real reason that his brothers dislike him is because of the favoritism that his father shows him. It says that he gave him a coat of many colors. So that's one translation of that. But it's really a nice coat. Could have been long sleeve. And it was really showing that he was going to be the head of the family. This coat could be a coat like royalty. And all of his brothers saw it. He saw this favoritism. And you know, we need to be mindful of our emotions. Just like Jacob should have been careful with how he responded to Joseph in this story. We should be mindful of our emotions because sometimes we are going to like other, some people better than others. That is just the reality. Some people we kind of click with and just get along with better. Some people irritate us more because of their personalities or whatever the situation may be. Now, that is true. But how do we respond to the others around us? So how could Jacob have responded differently? How do we treat others? How did he treat the brothers? He should have shown justice and kindness to them. You see, he was showing favoritism just to Joseph, but how could he have responded differently to the other brothers? So Jacob, also called Israel in this account, was part of the problem of the family problem. He was part of the problem. And he did love his son greatly. But if he was going to be more like God, we see that God is no respecter of persons, that God is not playing favoritism, but God is impartial. That God always shows justice. So whatever our emotions are with our family members, we need to treat them in a just manner. To be kind to them. To be more like Christ in all the things we do. We need to be mindful of our emotions and how others even see those things, perceive those. And I want us to understand too, as we look at everybody in this story, that these are not flat characters. Sometimes we look at our family members like that. We only think about the bad things they've done but not who they are fully, not their background, not the things they have gone through, but not a flat character. Jacob, he really loved Joseph. There's no doubt about that. Jacob was also a follower of God. Jacob was also a trickster. He tricked his family. Jacob was also tricked. So his story is pretty expansive. He also experienced loss. His wife, the mother of Joseph, had passed away. Now, all these things are not excuses for Jacob's behavior. It says that he loved Joseph just because he was really the son he had in his old age, not because Joseph did anything great or that he was just this great character. So these reasons were kind of skewed. Now, these are no excuses for his behavior, but he did have lots of scars. Our family members have lots of scars. We have lots of scars. And how we respond to people is going to look very differently because we're all fallen people. Jacob was a fallen person as well. And he needed God's grace to do the right thing. We need empathy. See, the brothers, they should have had empathy for their father. They should have empathy for their brother. And Jacob should have had empathy for his own children. We need to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. You've probably heard that term before, to have empathy, to have compassion for others. Whatever's going on in your family members' lives, realize there are scars. There's, they're not flat characters. They're bringing much to the story. And we also see from Scripture that Jesus put on flesh. He became a man, and he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Jesus understands. He has walked a mile in our shoes. He understands 
what the struggle of the human condition is. And he was without sin. And he calls out to us. He's a high priest that can relate to us because he knows how it hurts to be betrayed by those that you love, by your friends. He understands what we're going through at all times. And here's the truth too. The brothers, they were hurt. They were hurt by the actions of their father. And often we just think about how terrible it was what the brothers did. But they were hurt by how their father treated him. And no matter how your parents treat you, no matter what they think of you, no matter if you're the favored child or not, the reality is God will always receive you. There are many people. There are many orphans. There are many people that have deadbeat parents and go through life wondering, why, why did they give me up for adoption? Why did they do this to me? God is always willing to receive us. He is a good heavenly father. And he is going to love us and treat us justly, unlike Jacob did. Jacob, again, was a fallen man, and he was part of the problem. But here's a big part, too, that we always think about the brothers. Verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So Jacob was part of the problem, but now here's another part of the problem. The brothers, they were jealous. So Jacob, instead of showing favoritism, he should have been just in the way that he treated his, his other sons. The brothers here were jealous. They should have been content in what they had. Content in what God had given them. Content in what even their father had given them. Jacob's favoritism, now this is a very, very important point. Jacob's favoritism did not force the reaction of the brothers. This is important for all of us. We should not make any excuses saying, so-and-so did this to me. They made me do this. Nobody makes us do anything. Now, these things can be very influential on us. This mistreatment, it hurts us, it hurts us. But we all make a choice, and the brothers made a choice. They made a choice to hate Joseph because of what Jacob was doing. So nobody forces you to behave in that way. So whatever your family problems are right now, don't say so-and-so made me do that. So-and-so makes me so angry. They don't have control over you. We are responsible for our own hearts. We are responsible for our own actions in the situation. Now the brothers, they had reasons to hate, right? They did. We have reasons. But our heart is deceitful. And it can fool us. It can fool us very easily. We're blinded by anger. We're blinded by the hurt that comes from our family members or from other people that we love. They were jealous. Well, they really should have been content. God blesses others. What is your response to that? You know, do you have a family member that maybe you've got some kind of argument, disagreement with now? And you see them get this great promotion. And they got more money than you now. And you see them have this great situation here. This great situation there. These blessings upon them. How do you feel about it? What is your response? Do you remember the parable of the prodigal son? Often we think about in that parable, the prodigal son. The one that went away from home, wasted all of his wealth, and then came back to the father with nothing. But you realize the main point, if you look at the context, the reason that Jesus was telling that parable was because of the older brother. Do you remember what the older brother did? Was he pleased with his brother coming back and being saved? Were the religious leaders pleased with the Gentiles coming into being saved? Were the religious leaders pleased with what Jesus was doing? They weren't. They had reasons, but they were wrong. And often this can be our own heart. You see, that older brother, he was the religious one. He was the one that had been faithful to stay with his father. Yet, he held hatred in his heart. He was angry at his brother being redeemed. How are we responding to the family members that are hurting us? Are we jealous over the things that are happening? Or are we content in who we are in God? In what God has given us, in the place God has placed us? The brothers, again, are not flat characters. It's very complicated. The whole story of Joseph is very complicated. They obviously were hurt by the situation. And their anger, we see in the next passage, that they actually decided they were going to kill Joseph. I mean, that's pretty bad anger, isn't it? But it gets to that point. Jesus says that anger in the heart is basically as bad as murder. That's where murder comes from. That hatred that we allow to sit in our hearts. But they're not, they're, they're very complicated characters. Reuben 
whenever they decide they're going to kill Joseph, he talks them out of killing him. Do you remember that? Now, he hated him too, but he talked them out of killing him. Then Judah, Judah decided that after Reuben had disappeared, he's like, you know, yeah, maybe we shouldn't kill him. You're not going to have anything to gain out of that. Maybe we should sell him. Here comes these Ishmaelites. Let's sell him into slavery and make some money out of this situation at least. So they're complicated characters. They saved his life, and then God's sovereignty he had a purpose in that. But life is complicated. Families are complicated. There's lots of twists and turns. You see God's sovereign hand. The fact that Joseph, being sold into slavery, really placed him where he needed to be to save his family later on. And we also see how Judah. So Judah was really a terrible, terrible person. He did lots of terrible things. But even though Joseph is the one that rises to power in Egypt and saves his brothers and forgives his brothers, the Messiah doesn't come through the line of Joseph. The Messiah comes through Judah. This bad family member. Here's the thing. We have bad family members that do bad things. But they have value to God. We can think about how angry we are at them. But they have value to God. How are we looking at them? Not only do they have value to God, God has a purpose for them. What are you doing in this situation? Are you being the light of God in this dynamic? Or are you just showing your anger? Are you just allowing your flesh to rule? Are you caring about other people that are made in the image of God and that God plans to use them in a special way? We see that later Joseph does. He saves his, his family and he also forgives them. They're still scared at the end of the story. If you go to the end of Genesis, they're scared after their father dies that Joseph's going to hurt them. But he's like, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. You see, that's God's sovereign hand. Whatever your family problems are right now, the people are meaning for evil. God is meaning it for good. He's shaping us more and more like Christ. So instead of being jealous, let us be content in who we are in the Lord. We should care for our family. We should forgive our family. You see, our forgiveness is based on Jesus' forgiveness. Our debt to Jesus is nothing compared to the debt that our family members owe to us. If he can forgive us, we can forgive others. And not only that, he empowers us to do it. The leaders that crucified Jesus, they had reasons to crucify him, didn't they? Were they valid reasons? No. Were they really reasoning through things with a deceitful heart? Yes. And that's what's happening with your family members that are causing problems right now. They're being deceived. They are blinded by sin. But do you remember what Jesus said as he hung on the cross? Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. You may say, well, they knew what they were doing. They wanted him killed. They wanted him on the, on the cross. They didn't full, un, fully understand the full scope of what they were doing. He says, forgive them. They know not what they do. I want to, you to realize that family member is causing problems right now. They're being foolish. It's causing disruptions in your family. They don't really know what they're doing. They're blinded by sin. We're called to forgive them. And we're called to be that light. Let us not be part of the problem. So Jacob is a part of the problem. The brothers are part of the problem. Now what about Joseph? Isn't he the, the savior of Israel? He's part of the problem too. He's part of the problem too. Now he's a young man, no doubt. And he was not really very wise with his words. He didn't think about his tongue. We were talking about the tongue in Sunday school today as well. That little fire. It starts the forest fire. That little tongue. He wasn't wise. He'd gotten these dreams. These visions from God. We see they are prophetically fulfilled later on in Genesis. He had seen these sheaves. And his brothers were represented by some of the sheaves. And they bowed to him. And then he had his vision of the stars. That represented his brothers. And the moon and the sun. That represented his father and his, his other mother. And they all bowed to him. And he shared it with his brother. And he shared it with his father. His brothers hated him more. His father rebuked him. This was the truth though, wasn't it? It was. He'd been given this vision. He'd been given this dream. It was the truth that he was sharing. But why did Joseph share it? What was his motive? Now scripture doesn't really unpack it fully for us. Was he bragging? Was he like poking them a little bit about that? He's like, y'all hate me, but you know, one day I'm going to rule over you. We don't know what his heart was. 
But here's the thing is often when we, when we run our mouths, when we're speaking out, we're not thinking about the good coming out of our mouth, are we? We're wanting to tear down. We're wanting to win the argument. We need to be careful about our mouths. We need to discern. You see, Jesus, as he walled the earth, he shared truth, did he not? But sometimes he withheld truth. Sometimes he did not speak. When he was on trial, he did not speak. You see, we got to be wise about our tongues. We gotta have to have discernment. We don't have to share everything <laughs> that we know about the situation. We don't have to share all of our opinions about the situation. We don't have to win every argument. You hear that? We do not have to win every argument. It's not going to do any good. Are we pouring into other people or are we tearing them down? Think before you speak. Immaturity was certainly a problem here for Joseph. No doubt a 17-year-old, he didn't really think about the full aspect of what he was doing. But listen, sometimes I wonder if we ever even get out of middle school, y'all. <laughs> the truth is, we still say foolish sayings and tear down each other. We are very immature in our walk. That is a major problem. We need to be wise when we deal with these family problems. Be wise. His father rebuked him for what he said, even though he was telling the truth. But he was adding fuel to the fire. He absolutely was. And we see the next passage over that this is when his brothers decide, hey, I'm going to kill him. Do you remember how he got to his brothers? His father sent him to check on his brothers. It's like foolishness all through the story. And that is the reality of our family. Lots of foolishness. Now, here's the thing. Maybe when we think about these family problems, we just think about that other person, what they've done, their sin, their problem. Remember, it's them. But we should not assume our innocence. We should suspect ourselves. In every conflict, do not assume you are innocent. Suspect yourself. Take a look at yourself. What have you done? Do you remember when Jesus told about the, the plank in the eye versus the speck in your brother's eye? Now, which one is heavier, that plank or that speck? It's the plank. And who had the plank? You did. You see, whatever that sin is, that speck in our brother or sister's eye, in our family's eye, he says, first weigh that plank. Your sin is weightier. You see, we are responsible for ourselves. We are not ultimately responsible for other people's actions. But he says, deal with that plank. Deal with that sin. And then you can speak into the lives of your family members. And this is where the reality is. Do not assume you're innocent. Take a perspective. Look at yourself and see, have you sinned? Have you said something that really added fuel to the fire and continued to make the situation worse? If you did, repent of it. And then you'll be able to address the situation with a clean heart. You'll be able to address the situation in a way that pleases God. Bring your problems to God. Confess that sin. Bring your problems to God. That dynamic that's still going on with your family. Because God is working. And pay attention. Pay attention to what God's allowing. This conflict. Because God is trying to shape you into the image of Christ. In everything. In all things. He's working for good. Making us a new image. But too many times, we don't want his hands on us, do we? We're just jumping to that fire. We want to just continue to hold grudges and not forgive people. We want to continue to stir the pot. But God is trying to shape us. God is trying to develop our character and making us more and more like Christ. God allowed you to have these family problems. His sovereign hand. He allowed you to have these family problems. You see, he gives us freedom. And people made choices. They made sinful choices. And that's why these dynamics go on. They were made. But God is allowing them to shape you. To shape you. Jacob, even after he rebuked Joseph, he kept it in mind, these dreams. He remembered what God had done in his own life. He remembered the visions that God had given to him. How God has sovereignly worked through his life, even through bad situations. God is working in your life, even in this bad situation. We need to step back from it and look at what God is doing. Remember, conflict is inevitable, and we should expect it, and we should prepare for it. That means being in God's word. That means submitting to God, preparing for this conflict, dealing with sin. We are fallen people, living with fallen people in a fallen world world but all things work together for good 
to those who love God. He's trying to shape us into his image. Favoritism is causing problems. We need to be just. Jealousy is causing problems. We need to be content. We need to think before we speak. You see, wisdom is throughout all of this. We are being shaped and we need to forgive. We need to bring peace. We need to bring light. You should not be part of the problem. Now is a time of commitment. How is God speaking to you today? What is this family problem that you've been dealing with? Are you, have you been unwilling to forgive? Is the problem you? Confess your sin. Come to God. And maybe you're estranged from your family today. Whatever that situation may be, God is willing to receive you. God is willing to forgive you. And God is willing to shape you into somebody that you cannot be on your own. What is God doing for you right now? It's been good to be in God's house today. And I pray that whatever it is, the burdens that you are dealing with in your families right now, or maybe in your workplaces, whatever that conflict is, you continue to look at your own heart and to see where you're at in that. Remember, do not assume your innocence. Think about it. What are you doing? Are you being representing a representative of Christ in what you are doing? We need to confess our sins daily and to be in His Word. Father, thank You for Your blessings upon us. I thank You for Your forgiveness. I thank You for Your mercies and Your grace. And I thank You that You are shaping us even in these difficult situations. You are molding us into the image of Your Son. And I pray that You help us to pursue holiness, to walk in the Spirit, and just to be your representative wherever we go, Lord, to forgive others and to continue just to shine your light wherever we go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.